Uh, all right. So the next, uh, I just want to finish off this last thing about uh, human identity. Um, God created man male and female after his own image. So that has direct bearing on the, you know, the whole transgender uh, issue that's come up in the last eight years. Uh, it was interesting that the, what the ink was barely dry on the Obergefell decision that uh, uh, mandated uh, gay marriage throughout the United States. And it was like the next day transgenderism was in the news. Prior to that day, it was not in the news. Next day, it was in the news. It was the next, the next cause. It was the, ne the next group that, um, whose rights uh, needed to be championed, um, or so it was thought. So that whole issue has come up. It's an ideology. It's an ideology that says that your body can be different uh, from your internal psychology. The person within can be different than the body without. Um, in Genesis 1, it's male and female. Those are, these are, those are the terms of sexual distinction. They can be applied to animals. Uh, so it's the technical term for what differentiates a male from a female. God created us. We're either male or female. Um, there is no, we, we are a binary. There, there's no third sex. There's no, um, uh, there, there, there's no, um, you know, I think uh, Facebook published some 50 possibilities uh, of uh, gender identity as back in 2015. Um, uh, so, so no, the Christian view is uh, you are what your body is. You're male or you're female. That de that's determined, that uh, sexual identity is determined by your body. That's what you are. And, and so what a Christian is going to say, uh, you need to get your mind aligned with your body, not your body aligned with your mind. So you don't alter the body to conform to your internal sense of self. You get your internal self of sense, self, lined up with what you physically are. You are what your body is. Um, so I'll, that's tied, again, directly into our doctrine of, of creation. So I think it's becoming increasingly important in our day that, that, we, that we understand um, uh, the importance of, the, the foundational importance of creation for everything for us uh, from you know, the ethical issues, theological issues uh, to evangelism. All right, so providence, what do we mean by providence? What? Anybody want to just answer that? What do we mean by providence? The decree of God's work whereby all things are directed to the praise of his glory and the good of those who love him. Right, so it's God directing of all that he has created. It's God governing and sustaining of all things. That's what we mean when we use the word providence. Providence is, a, as, as it were, this, a shorthand for what we are indicating when we're talking about God governing all things, sustaining all things, directing all things toward their appointed end. So the confession says, um, the confession says, God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose and govern, dispose and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least by his most wise and holy providence according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will to the praise and the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Uh, so the question Question number six, what we mean by providence, it uh, may be helpful to distinguish between, in other words, providence is, is establishing how does God relate to what he has created? The answer, the Christian answer is he governs and sustains all that he has created. The wrong answers are pantheism, which confuses God with the creation. Uh, Francis Schaeffer liked to call this pan-everythingism. God is everything. Everything is God. So when I was in college, um, transcendental meditation became very popular. Uh, the Maharishi Mahish Yogi, anybody ever heard of him? Oh, this was a big deal. This was a real big deal. Eastern religions, you know, the Beatles and all, and Hare Krishna. Boys too, Not the boys. Oh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Southern California. No. 
Not, didn't get in their music. <laughs> didn't corrupt the music like did the Beatles, I don't think. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Boy, boys from, Southern, from the beaches of Southern California, are just not, they're not going to go there musically. But a, a, anyway, yeah, that was very, very popular in the late 60s. In many ways, I think that we are reliving the 60s right now. In so many ways, uh, what were, the things that were introduced and were radical in the 1960s are reappearing right now. Some, one of these days, I'm going to just draw up a list because it's just uncanny to me the way it's like a nightmare. The, the 60s is being revisited upon us right now. Um, so but the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi introduced Transcendental Meditation. It was like the camel's nose of Hinduism into the, into, in, into the Western world. And what he said, which to me was just hilarious, you know, in my little 20-year-old self, a, a college student, I just thought, I mean, how do people keep a straight face with this stuff? He said, I am that, thou art that, and all this is that. That's it. That. Everything is that. Everything is, in, in other words, ev everything is the, the ultimate substance of reality. We have emerged from that reality, um, and, and our doing so is, is actually a negative development, and one day we will be reabsorbed into the eternal that, the eternal arm, and lose our distinctive individuality, which they see as an aberration. And that's why, you know, in the East, if, if you are a nail that is poking up from, um, you know, the wood, they, the, 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 in the East, the, the, they are going to take a hammer and, and hammer you back down so that you don't stick out anymore. It's all, it's, it's all connected philosophically. Uh, I wish I was better at convincing people that everything ultimately comes back to uh, philosophical, theological fundamentals. Um, even, you know, Sunday night introducing aesthetics and fashion and all of this. These are all expressions of a theology, of a philosophy. Ultimately, they, they develop out of a framework, of a worldview framework that is, that is moving in one direction or another. So pantheism is the idea that everything is an extension of the substance of God. And one day, everything will be reabsorbed into that eternal substance and lose its individuality. Everything is God, um, hence sacred cows, um, hence a plague of rats, you know, in, in India. You can't, India is Hinduism in so, in so many ways. Um, uh, deism, deism is the clock, the clockmaker's, uh, watchmaker's view of God. God is, here God is confused with the creation. With deism, God is excluded from the creation. He creates the world, he winds it up, and then he just lets it go. He walks away from it. And so there's, God uh, sets up the principles and laws by which the world is to operate. And then he, he removes himself entirely from it. He is utterly inaccessible. He is uninvolved. Um, prayer is useless. There's nothing supernatural. There, miracles cannot occur. He's not governing things. He's not sustaining things. They're all, uh, everything is holding together through the operation of impersonal laws that he has established. So he's entirely separated from creation. Christian theism says that creation is from God, but it's not a part of God. It is separate from God, and that the creation, however, is continually uphold, upheld, sustained, and governed by God. The creature-creator distinction is fundamental to Christianity. The creator is not ever to be confused with created things. He is absolutely other. Transcendent and immanent. Yes, trans good point. Transcendent and immanent. So transcends everything. He is wholly other. And yet uh, immanent um, through his spirit and, 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 and particularly in the incarnation of Christ. So actively involved in the creation, um, governing, sustaining. So what we call natural law, I think the right way to see it as a Christian, natural law is, to, is to describing the ordinary way in which God acts. Uh, and because he's faithful, those laws are reliable. Uh, what do we call it when he violates those natural laws? Miracle. Yeah, that's one of these questions, isn't it? It's, 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 a, it's a miracle. I think the deism is also quite, uh, I'm 
compelling for a lot of people these days too. Not that they would identify themselves as deists, but the notion, people use this escape hatch of, I'm an agnostic. I kind of say, there probably was some God that created things, but he's inaccessible. He's, he doesn't have anything to do with my life. It's pretty compelling for, I don't know, I feel like a lot of people I work with, professional class folks, it's, it, that and pantheism are very compelling. Yeah, I think that there's a, there's per perhaps the majority religion in America is, is a practical atheism. Not, not doctrinal atheism, not the, an atheism of conviction, like I've thought this through and I've con drawn to the conclusion that there is no God. I just live as though there were no God. The existence of God does not affect anything I do. It doesn't affect my decisions. It doesn't, it doesn't affect the way that I live. It doesn't affect my outlook. I live as though there were no God. That seems to me, um, what was it, uh, what was it that, um, that uh, Christian sociologist, um, was it Christian Smith? Uh, said of America's teenagers that they are, one of you's got this on the tip of your tongues, don't, don't you? Um, uh, they are um, moralistic, therapeutic theists. That's their Christianity. Yeah, that's their, that's their form of Christianity. Moralistic, God wants me to be nice. That's the moral. That's, uh, the moral code is I'm supposed to be nice. So we do have a culture of niceness. I mean, what's that, the, the worst thing that you can, huh? That's supposed to Oh, yeah. I mean, the worst thing that you can be is not be nice. Right? I mean, you can be an adulterer, a fornicator. You know, you, you, you can be a lot of things that are, that are pretty degrading. But you, if you're nice, that's the main thing. You're supposed to be nice. Moralistic, so that be nice. Therapeutic. Um, God is there to make me feel good. So he, he's basically not a part of my life. But um, when I need him, I can call upon him, and he'll help me. And he'll make me feel better. Uh, deism, um, uh, moralistic, therapeutic, uh, is it, did he call it theism or deism? Anyway, there, huh? It is, is it deism? Yeah, God's just out there, except when I need him. He, he, you know, he's, 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 uh, uh, he's like a good pet. You know, when you need him, you call him, he'll, he'll run in and he'll help you. So that, that's basically the religion of, you know, America's young people. It's, it's, it's America's view of God. I, I certainly don't want God interfering with things. That's what I don't want. I want, I, don't, I want to be free to live my life the way I want to live it. And so I keep him out there remote. And when I'm really in trouble, then I'll, 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 you know, I'll allow him in and let him help me. And then I want to push him back out again because I don't want him interfering. I have my life to live. I'm the captain of my own ship. I want to go my own course. I'm going to go my own way. Uh, and I don't want any interference from him. Okay. You gotta send me that quote. That's a great one. <laughs> a grandfather in heaven. Yes, Charlie. They may be right though, because we learned earlier that, that God passes by those that, uh, that are not chosen. He passes them by. Yeah, he gives them over. Yeah, he does withdraw in that respect. But that's a part of the judgment. Is that they are just let to go their own way and with all the repercussions all the consequences that are going to result from it in this world and the next. All right, number seven, to what is the extent of God's control over the creatures? Uh, what do you make of the concept of luck or chance? Total control. You should be answering total control. Uh, back to the decree, whatsoever comes to pass. Uh, luck or chance, uh, those words are not a part of our vocabulary. We should not, I think we, our language should line up with our theology. So I don't think we should be saying good luck to people. I, I, I think we should say God bless you. I think that we should find something. Huh? Excuse me? Providential blessings was what Kyle taught me when he was here. And Kyle did? Yeah. <laughs> there are things to root out, fortunate, unfortunate. We use them all, all the time. Yeah, so at some point, I'm wondering about with uh, unfortunate, if that has gotten remote enough from the concept of fortune that it can be utilized. But you're right, the root of it is fortune. What determines the outcome of events? Fortune does. Chance does. Not God. Things don't happen as, as he ordains and determines uh, they should. They happen, uh, you know, if you, uh, a Christian, if I walk out the door and I step out into the lane and somebody comes, you know, wheeling around the corner and runs me over and I'm, 
uh, a paraplegic as a, as a result of that, is that just bad luck? I think that's what most people would say, it's bad luck. They would, uh, you know, it's, uh, what, a, you know, what a misfortune. Um, excuse me? Bad <laughs> bad, yeah. Um, but I would, a Christian is going to know that ultimately that happened by the hand of God. And so there was a purpose in it. And, and that's really the key thing here is that do we know as Christians that as life unfolds, that what comes to us comes to us by the hand of God and it is for our good always, our eternal good, not our immediate good, not what I perceive to be good at the moment, not what pleases me or is pleasant or desirable or what I have would have uh, planned and wanted, but is do I have the confidence it's for my ultimate eternal good? Yes, we know that. We know that because God is wise. We know that because God is good. We know that because God is all-powerful. He could have prevented it. He didn't. He permitted it. He allowed it. He ordained it. Um, and he is good, so it's for good reasons, and he's wise, and so it was the best course of action. It was better than the alternatives. But and we need to stop short of trying to read the tea leaves and what was God trying to tell you with that driver? I agree. Good point. I, I, think that, um, I think that typically the reasons are, are beyond discernment. And, you ha and I think you have to be happy that. The prophet Isaiah says, surely you are a God who hides himself. Yeah, yeah his purpose, his, his, the end of Romans 11, his ways are inscrutable. We, do, we don't know. You know, I, I always go back to my broken leg, and people get tired of hearing of it, I'm sure, five months in a body cast and all that in a hospital bed. Why did that happen? I have no idea why that happened. I mean, I could guess at it, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the mind of God. I, I think I'll find out in eternity, but I don't know right now. And I think, I think lots of life is just, they're just, events are just head scratchers. You don't know. You don't know why things turned out as they did. As a Christian, though, it's the hand of God, and God is good, and God is great, and, and God is wise. Yes? And, but, but a very slight percentage of the time, if you put yourself out there, he shows you. He just lays it right out in front of you. You wanted this? You didn't get it, it went right downhill, you tried to do that, and then I had to take care of it at the exact yeah. so right I, time, so the glory goes to me. I think you're right about that, but I also think there's a lot of times when we're just baffled by it. I think especially tragic events, we're just baffled. Well, why? why, 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 why? This is, yeah. you know, and, and the most mature Christians struggle with this, these uh, things. My, 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 my sainted mother-in-law, you know, she, she would say, you know, um, Dale and Alice Jean were do down at the, at the Skid Row mission working with the poorest poor people and drug addicts and all of, all of this and, and alcoholics. And while they were doing that, their house was robbed. Why would God allow that to happen? That just troubled her enormously. You know, and for me, it was kind of a head scratcher. Uh, um, you know, and I would say respectfully to my mother-in-law that you know, we don't know the purposes of God, but we know that he's good, we know that he's wise, and we know that he, it could have been other than it was. So he has a purpose in it. These are not, uh, these, this is not happening by chance. It is not misfortune. Fortune is not against us. Uh, all right, let's keep going here. Um, number eight, what mi misconceptions does 5-2 guard against? Um, how do you respond to the charge that this teaching makes robots of us? So, two says, although in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God, the first cause, all things come to pass immutably and infallibly, yet by the same providence, in other words, they cannot but come to pass. That's what is meant by immutably and infallibly. Yet by the same providence, he ordereth them to fall out according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or contingently. Um, so the reality of second causes is be being affirmed. So why did, we talked about this at prayer, the prayer meeting this morning. <laughs> Things are overlapping beautifully at this moment. So why did the pin just fall? I can describe that many ways, several different ways, all of which are true. It fell because of the decree of God and uh, the providence of God 
in making the pin fall. That's true because he upholds all things, uh, because he sustains all things, because he governs all things. So the pin fell because God ordained that it should fall. Why else did it fall? It fell did because you just there's... God when you caught that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, because whatsoever, I didn't. Uh, it also fell because there's a law of gravity. So that's the second cause. It also fell, so it fell because God ordained it. it, it fell because of the law of gravity, and it fell because I released it. So there's, um, there are these, uh, there's agency, there's kind of the agency of law, there's the agency, my agency, and then there's God's ultimate causation. All those things are true. So what, what happens if you deny second causes? You, be, you become a fatalist. Or, or, you, or you, deny, you, deny, um, you deny God. You end up with a scaled down God. You end up with a, a God uh, who is not God. So what, um, what fatalists are saying is it's all up to God. So when I was in England, um, uh, there was a missionary who was studying at Trinity College who had been in the, in the Islamic world. And um, her child and their you know, undoubtedly pov very impoverished situation, the infant had rolled over into the fire that was in the middle of their room, uh, their house, their hut, whatever exactly it was, and, and burned to death. And he sh this missionary said, the woman said, the will of Allah. Just almost, eh, the will of Allah about it. Um, so that, that to me is, is fatalism. There's nothing you can do about it. It's just the will of Allah. There's no more to be said about it. As though, you know, human agency was irrelevant. As though we weren't responsible for what we do or accountable for what we do or active agents in bringing about what happens. So you that make the... That extends to their view of salvation as well. That's you right. On the razor's edge, whatever Allah... Yeah, and, and, yeah that's right. Because ultimately you, uh, you enter into heaven according to the will of Allah and it's, they, they will not even say it's be by being a good Muslim. And even works, well, they say, you know, you got an advantage by good works, but ultimately it's, it's the, the will of Allah is the ultimate in the end. And so there is a fatalism in that world. Christians have always said, the, uh, affirm the reality of second causes. We are not fatalists. Yes, question. Um, would the Stoic philosophers agree with that as well, just a more fatalistic worldview? Would that be consistent with, with Stoicism? I, you know, I don't know enough about Stoicism to say is, I, I don't know, is that the underpinnings of Stoicism? I know that you're just supposed to endure whatever happens and, and accept it uh, bravely, um, but is, is that because these things are unavoidable and you need to just face that you live in a universe where things are programmed and they're gonna happen, there's nothing you can do about it? I don't know. I don't know if that's Stoicism to answer that question. So second cause is they, they necessarily, you know, that, that's that, uh, freely, um, I had this in my mind the other day. What is freely? Things happening freely. Um, but contingently, you know, a row of dominoes. Contingently. The dominoes fall contingent upon the previous one falling on it, right? So there would be contingency. Um, the nature of second causes. Um, so things happen because of natural law. Um, necessarily they happen. The pin does fall because there's gravity built into the system. Um, happening freely, we, we do things freely. So yeah, you know, me throwing the pin across the room, that happened freely. Um, contingently is a series of events, one depending upon the other. Those are all, and, and the point is, these things are all true. Simultaneously, we can talk about these things. These, these are the different perspectives from which we can view events. They happen by the hand of God. They happen because we do things. They happen because there are natural laws in the universe that God has established. So if you drive your truck out on the ice in Wisconsin in May, when the ice is thinned out. It happens way before that, but we're with you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't push the details of my analogy. <laughs> Your truck may end up at the bottom of the lake. Yeah, my, you know, my daughter Sally, is, she's a Georgian, and she was up, you know, they, 
her in-laws have a place on the lake in Wisconsin, and she's, it's just absolutely stunning to watch these pickup trucks driving out into the middle of a lake. There's little pine trees for you know street corners, and they plow them, actually. The guys that go out there have little trucks that plow roads in the snow so you can get out there. It's pretty hilarious that they prefer to sit in a four by four foot wooden place out in the middle of the cold looking at a hole in the ice that they would oh, be in their house, fun. you know. Relaxing. Yeah, fun. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, number, um, yeah, number eight, what misconceptions? Uh, ro robots. You know, we, we don't have, we're just puppets on a string. Uh, nothing we do makes any difference. We have no agency. That is, uh, that's being denied by second causes. So the God who ordains the, you know, the, the ends ordains the means to the end. That's, that's a note I want to get across. He ordains the means to the end. The means of the pin dropping is my lifting it up and releasing it. So that if God ordained for the pin to drop, he didn't ordain it. And so because I failed to do it, you know, as I'm talking here in the middle of this, you all are looking forward. Suddenly the pin goes up on its own because I neglected to do what, you know, God had ordained and, and, and it dropped itself. Uh, no, he ordains the means to the end. So the means and ends both are uh, of Providence, the pro in the in, uh, ordained uh, and, and, and directed by the providence of God. All right, number. That's why Calvinists evangelize. <laughs> yes. That's why. Yeah. Yes, and that's why we pray. So we'll get to those, but that's why we pray. Is pray a means? Yes. Is it a, is it a cause? Yes. There, is there causation and agency in prayer? Yes. In evangelism? Yes. Does God ordain who is saved and who isn't saved? Yes. Like everything else he ordains. But does that deny agency? Does that deny second causes, uh, uh, human causation? No, it doesn't. Uh, number nine, how many questions do we have here? Fourteen. All right. Number nine, what do we call it when God works without, above, or against ordinary means? Miracle. We call it a mi miracle. So paragraph three, God in his ordinary providence maketh use of means. Again, that's the point of the pin. The pin drops because he makes use of my grabbing a hold of the pin, moving it here, and letting go of it uh, in his ordinary. So I, w I, want, I hope you will develop a love for this very, very, very Presbyterian word, ordinarily. That leaves God open to do whatever he wants, but we don't fail to recognize that here is what he ordinarily does. Ordinarily, he makes use of means. So every once in a while, like Paul on the Damascus Road, he'll shout out, a he out, out of heaven at someone and, and, and save them. Does that ordinarily happen? No. We only know of it happening once in 2,000 years. Uh, can he do that? Of course. But ordinarily, we shouldn't expect it. And we shouldn't plan our lives on the basis of extraordinary things, rather on ordinary, ordin God's ordinary ways of doing things. So ordinarily, God maketh use of means, yet is free to work without, above, and against them at his pleasure. And when he does, we call those miracles. Uh, all right, next question. Ten, what does con the confession have to say about the permissive will of God? This is so good. Question four, the almighty power, unsearchable wisdom, and infinite goodness of God. There's our trio again. Did you catch it? Power wisdom, goodness of God so far manifests themselves in his providence that it extendeth itself even to the first fall and of all other sins of angels and men and that not by a bare permission. So first of all, the fall itself. Did God, as it were, speaking very anthropomorphically, wake up one morning and say, oh my goodness, Look at what Adam and Eve have done. They have taken from the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil against my command and have sinned. What do I do now? I've got to think up plan B. Um, so did that take God by surprise? Was that outside the plan? Did he have to scramble about to try to you know, figure out how he's going to fix the situation? Or was Christ, is Christ the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world? Does it extend to the fall itself? Yes, it does. Of course it does. Um, so, um, extent, uh, not by a bare permission. 
what would be a bare permission? God, did, uh, did, God, did God say to himself, well, you know, I, I guess uh, they want to eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, so I, hmm, I guess I'll let them do that. That would be a bare permission. No, what the confession is saying, it's not just a simple shrug of the shoulders, I guess I'll permit that to happen. Permission, kind of in isolation from any considerations. I'm just going to permit it. Kind of like parents, you know, when they just give, give up and go ahead, get, get the keys, take the car. They just finally just give up and go and suffer the consequences. No. Um, not by a bare permission, but such as joineth with it a most wise and powerful bonding and otherwise ordering. ordering and governing of them in a manifold dispensation to his own holy ends. Uh, so whatever we make of permission, and I think the language of permission is, is permitted. Uh, permission permitted. I think that permission is, is I, I think that we can use a range of terms. We can talk about what God permits. At the same time, we talk about what God ordains and what he decrees and what he predestines. I think all of that language, just depending on the perspective from which we're speaking, is, is allowed. I think that, however, what we need to understand is when we use the word permit, it's not a passive permitting that is disconnected from purpose. It's permission with purpose, permission with purpose, always. Permission with purpose. Why does he permit? He pit permits because it suits his plan and his purpose. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart feels like such a good example. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It's, it was, it was a, a wickedness that Pharaoh was hardening of his heart, but the source was from God. Yes, and it's even better than what, than what you're saying because it, it's, it's stated in three different ways in Exodus. It says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. There's human agency. He's responsible. He has a hard heart. Why does he have it? Because he hardened his heart. It says, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, passive voice, no um, agency attributed. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. All, the final agency, ultimate causation, God. Our, all three of those things are true. They have, to be, they have to be affirmed simultaneously. Pharaoh is responsible for his hard heart, even though God hardened his heart because it suited his purpose to do so. Uh, so, th so this goes on then. It says, as so the sinfulness thereof proceedeth only from the creature and not from God, who being most holy and righteous, neither is can nor can be the author and approver for sin. So God ordains the fall. Does that mean that Adam is not responsible for the fall? No, Adam is responsible. He was a moral agent. He made a decision. He made a choice. Did Pharaoh harden his heart? Yes. Did it suit the purposes and plan of God? Yes. Is God's plan eternal and rooted in eternity? Yes. Is, is, is there somehow, is it somehow true that, that Pharaoh, nevertheless, is responsible for what Pharaoh did? Yes, on Judgment Day, we will be held accountable for what we did. We are responsible, moral agents. We do what we do because we want to do it. When we get to the chapter on uh, the will um, and uh, free will, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in, in more detail. Uh, so what, uh, what's the question? Um, um, what does the confession say about the permissive will of God? Um, it's, it's in fact, cautioning us not to see um, God as um, per just permitting things. He's not the grandfather. With, with, uh, yet having no, no purpose in it. The confession doesn't, it describes God's will in many other ways, but it doesn't describe it as permissive. Just, it, it's not the way the confession looks at it. Yeah. Oh, okay, you know what, I, I, I meant to have some verses up here along the way, um, uh, so I've skipped them. And uh, back to question number six, uh, just, just for further information, uh, transcendence and eminence, these are some good examples. For thus says the Lord who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place, and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly 
and to re uh, revive the heart of the contrite. So high and lifted up, transcendent, and yet dwelling with uh, the lowly. Uh, heaven is my throne, yet earth is my footstool. Isaiah 66. Um, uh, all these things my hand has made. I'm the creator of the universe, and so all these things came to be. I spoke and it was done, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, to he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Uh, verses on upholding the universe. Uh, Hebrews 1, 3. He, speaking of Christ, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Uh, Colossians 1, 17. In him all things hold together. Uh, the extent of providence. You know, the, we're back to the sparrows again, but uh, not one falls to the ground apart from your father. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. So I should have brought those verses in earlier, but those for your consideration. Question 10, um, what do, does the confession have to say about the permissive will of God? I, I want to introduce these, this concept. Um, the confession speaks of the will of God in two proper senses. There is the decretive will of God, and, and that's what takes place in history. And then there is his preceptive will, and that is what God commands. In popular Christian usage, there's also then the perfect will and the permissive will. I think that's an abuse of language, and it's a these are confusing concepts. So, in other, in other words, the question here is, is there a third will? That is neither what God has decreed and is going to happen, and is not what he commands and requires, but is some third thing what he kind of wants us to do. I believe this is a harmful way of speaking of the will of God. And I think the, and the reason why I would say that is I think it's not a biblical way of speaking of the will of God and also because those who utilize it are destroying Christian liberty. So to use an example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, what does the Apostle Paul say to those who are unmarried? He says, if you want to marry, Go ahead and marry. If you don't want to marry, don't marry. It's up to you. You have the liberty. You have the freedom to do that. You can marry or you cannot marry. He says, I advise that if you can remain single, you got the gift like I do to remain single, then remain single. That's wonderful. If you don't have the gift, go ahead and marry. You have not sinned. What's that mean? It means that it's Christian liberty. So when I'm trying to discern the will of God, I'm not concerned about what he's decreed, because that's going to happen. What I'm concerned about is, perceptive, is his preceptive will, his commands, and I, want to, and, and I want to pray so that when I choose things, I'll use wisdom in order to do so. I'll be guided by scripture. It'll be a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And, and, and so I'll pray for wisdom and a, a proper understanding of God's word and insight into my own uh, my own um, gifts and abilities and opportunities and d discern these things well. And then I have, have liberty to choose. I can marry. I cannot marry. I can take the job. I cannot take the job. I have that liberty. I, I don't sin in doing that. Uh, David wants to build a temple, and, and uh, Nathan tells him, go ahead and you know, begin to build the temple. And uh, you know, David, that was a positive thing. And then the next day, Nathan says, no, Solomon's going to build the temple. And so David contented himself with, you know, gathering the materials. So there, there's this, uh, this liberty for Christians. Um, uh, as Augustine said, uh, uh, love God and do what you want. I think that's good guidance. You have to recommend on this one Gary Friesen's decision-making and the will of God. Yes, Gary Friesen, decision-making and the will of God. I think that in the popular Christianity that I grew up with had me searching for the perfect will of God and tor is paralyzing. paralyzing. Absolutely. Because it's, it's out there, it's ethereal, it's out there somewhere and you can't find it. Uh, and so you're searching for the perfect will and I don't think that that's, that's at all the way that we're given direction. I think that we're told 
uh, what God commands. We're not to ever violate the commands. We're to live in accordance with uh, the Christian ideals and um, the Christian um, um, moral code. But within that framework, there's liberty. You start talking about a perfect will of God, there's no liberty. You've got to find that, whatever that perfect thing is. Do I marry person A, person B, or person C? So I'm looking for the perfect will. And um, I'm, t I'm torturing myself trying to figure out, does he want, to, does he want, want me to marry A, B, or C? And I, I, can't under, I, can't, I can't figure that out. And, and what happens when she disagrees with me? <laughs> that's another issue altogether. Uh, so, so, but, and I'm, I'm terrified that I might marry the wrong one because his perfect will was A, but you know, then I, I married C instead. Can't we put fleece out on the lawn? No. <laughs> o only in Wisconsin. <laughs> and only if your name is Gideon. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I just, you know, beware of this. Uh, what's the will of God? Well, it's what he's decreed. What else is the will of God? It's what he commands. This is the will of God, your sanctification. You, what about to who I marry? Well, you, you do have a command, right? You have a precept. Don't marry a non-Christian. You are commanded to marry in the Lord. Okay, so I need to marry a Christian. Um, after that, uh, then it's a matter of Christian liberty and wisdom. So I'm to choose wisely. Uh, you know, I don't think you can be married to every possible Christian girl. You know, I don't think all personalities mesh. I mean, that's a wisdom issue, right? I don't mesh well with that person. We don't get along well. We don't see eye to eye. Um, so uh, what I'm to do is I'm to use wisdom. I'm to pray for wisdom. I'm trying to discern the path of wisdom, who, the one for whom I am best suited to understand her, understand me, make a decision. Christian liberty. I like her the best. Marry her then. And enjoy your Christian liberty. So that goes back to the use of means. Yeah. The means of pr prayer and the, the word of God. So somewhere in all these notes, I've got uh, a long list of all the uses of... Uh, the will of God in the Bible, I mean in the confession, to try to demonstrate that these are the only two ways in which the will of God is used in the larger catechism, the shorter uh, catechism, is these two ways, what he decrees and what he commands. There is no third will that we are to try um, to, to discern. These are the secret things. Deuteronomy 20, 29, 29, 29. The, the secret things belong to God. He's not revealing the secret things, the hidden things. He's got, there's what he's revealed and commanded, and then there's what he's decreed, and then there's Christian liberty and Christian wisdom. And then that's how we make decisions, is based on those things. And I think in the process, you can have a very strong sense of what that means, that this is what I am to do. Like when I accepted the call here. I got a very strong sense that this is, this is you know, that's the sense of oughtness, the hand going in the glove. First time I did a Bible, led a Bible study, absolutely terrified, and uh, to, prepared like a madman, and went, and it was in the rival fraternity house. I was a beta at USC, a drunken beta, as they called themselves. I was a teetotaler. Um, and so the SAEs, I went to their house and led the Bible study, and that was exactly the experience. Felt like the hand going on the glove. And I, I just realized, I think this is what I'm meant to do. I think I'm called to do this. This, suit, this was suited. This fit me. This, this so I felt was the thing uh, that was meant for me, that I was made to do, gifted to do, called to do. Um, okay, so that I think that they're going to have that very, certainly you can have that very strong sense of, of oughtness, uh, but that's not the same thing as trying to find the divine, this hidden. So there are people actually terrified of the permissive will of God. Well, he permitted me to do it. And, you know, God permitted me to do some, something that was absolutely disastrous. Not, not against his commands, but uh, turned out to be d disastrous because he permitted me to do this thing that was not contrary to his commands, but was not his perfect will, and I did it. And, and so now I'm suffering the consequences. That's, what I, that's, that's what's paralyzing. 
that, that's what uh, just uh, a absolutely um, paralyzes us. Is we, if we think that, you know, God may permit me to make a terrible, terrible decision that nevertheless is not contrary to what he commands or, 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 or the Christian ideals uh, that we find, uh, you know, the fruit of the spirit and the beatitudes and so forth. On the other side, some people justify all sorts of kind of wild decisions. <coughs> they say, well, I sense God's will. And then you see some path that they took <coughs> as if they can have insight into something that they have no insight into. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah we're, in, we're into decision making now. And um, that's, so, so let me just say, <laughs> I can't resist this stuff. I, there, there's one, one, two of my best friends, they were actually brothers, and they were world-class swimmers who won Olympic medals and national championships, and they were both very charismatically oriented, and they married who they married because God told them. Both of them ended up divorced. God told them, yeah. So how do you argue with that? Well, see, people so, say that usually to stop any kind of reasonable yeah. uh, argument Right. There's no. There's no response to that. God told. Me, well, I mean, who am I to argue? And I. I, I just. In one, in one of the cases with the, the brother that I really knew was one of my best friends. I just said, Joe, what are, you? Joe, what? Uh, you. You two are a bad match. She is a difficult, difficult woman. What are you doing? He, and he was just a typical guy who was c totally oblivious to female feelings and all of that, just kind of, a, you know, just one of the dudes, you know. And, and uh, I just, she was like a high style, you know, very, he was just a plain guy, just, give, you know, give me my food and you know, watch the television. And we lose, too, when we're talking about Christian liberty, that wisdom is a moral imperative. Yes. Yeah. Part of following God's commands is act wisely. Yes. 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 And, so, and that that gets missed. Yes. Yes. You are commanded to be wise. Um, and in in this case, and, and that means uh, seeking out the counsel of others. And I knew him well, and I knew her well, and I went to him before the wedding, and I said, Joe, don't, don't do it. You are a bad match. She's this high style female, and, and you're this guy that wears a t shirt and cutoffs. And, the, the t and, you know, that just it was emblematic of the whole way of life between them. And I just thought, this is going to, and it was. It was I actually lived with them for a summer as I was interning at a church up in Northern California. And man, alive, the combat between the two of those. And the, they were not married for very long, and the disdain for each other, because, you know, he's just, he's Joe. And she's, high style and, you know, the contempt. Yeah. So how, how can we better say that? Because if it seems that if we're paying attention to what the Lord's doing around us, to see the way that we should go just by observation and wisdom, of course. I think there was an example uh, in one of, the, one of these evenings uh, where we acknowledged the apostles said something along the lines of it seems it good, good, to, it us. Seems good to us that Acts we should 15. go. Yeah, and I'm not saying like that's the permissive will of God, but there's, what would be the better way to articulate that to express to someone I think I'm following the Lord here. I'm not trying to make the Trump card move. Yeah, no, I think that that's the great example. Even the apostles who, do, who are agents of the direct revelation, yeah. when they make the decision at the Council of Jerusalem, they say it seemed. There's a tentativeness. They're not absolutists. They're not saying, God told me. They're not saying, thus saith the Lord. So they, the decision is actually a compromised decision in Acts 15. It's a, it's a, it's a, a wisdom that is trying to accommodate factions. And so it's, it's, the, it's the path of wisdom that they choose, where they say, okay, you know, there's nothing wrong with this meat offered to idols, but because of Jewish uh, scruples, let's, let's refrain from the meat. Of course, you can't commit fornication. That's out. But... Uh, and in the meantime, so abstain from meat that's offered to idols. So if I propose to a woman and she says, well, why do you want to marry me? And she says, well, it just seems like the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm just> so, <laughs> uh, talk, talk, talk to me later, okay? You need some help. All right, no, num number 10. <laughs> no. Uh, 
Number 10, what does the confession have to say about the permissive will of God? It, it really doesn't recognize it except to speak of bare permission, which is not the same as permission. It's per permission bound with purpose. Uh, and so it is not just I'm going to let things go or he's going to permit us to do something that's going to be damaging. Uh, is it God's will that his children should, should suffer? Uh, the answer is it is his will yeah. at times that uh, that uh, pe people should suffer. The most uh, wise, righteous, and gracious God doth oft times leave for a season his own children to manifold temptations and the corruptions, corruption of their own hearts to chasten them for their former sins or to discover unto them the hidden strength of corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts that they may be humbled and to raise them to a more close and constant dependence upon their for their support upon himself and to make them more watchful against all future occasions of sin and for sundry other just and holy ends. Back to Psalm 119, it was good for me. It was good for me that I was afflicted. And so we have these multiple scriptural examples uh, the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 7, to, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. Uh, why? Um, to keep me from becoming conceited. So I was afflicted. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. If I did not humble you, you would think that you could do ministry in your own strength. So I weakened you so that you would cry out to me and fully realize your dependence upon my grace for any good to come about through your labors. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. A tremendous uh, statement. The same from Deuteronomy uh, 8 and uh, so forth, probably better known by most of us, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet uh, trials of various uh, kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Um, you know, um, Malcolm Muggeridge, the the Christian convert late in life who was a writer for Punch magazine and a satirist and for most of his life and a socialist and a, just a, a hedonist uh, said he looked back over the whole span of his life and realized that there was, there was nothing in his entire life that, was, that he learned of value except in the context of suffering. I thought it was a really profound statement, but he could recognize that. Uh, the same stuff is being said, Psalm 119, 71, uh, verse 71, good for me that I was afflicted. Romans th 5, 3 to 5, same progression. Through suffering, here are all the good things, the benefits. Hebrews 12, 3 to 11, uh, our suffering is presented as God's discipline. It brings forth the fruit of holiness in our lives uh, through suffering. Uh, and also 1 first, first Peter. Um, all right, 1 um, Peter 1, 6 to 7. Uh, what is the goal of God's dealing with believers and unbelievers? Uh, what I am getting at here is the, um, the fact that where is page 23? Here it is. Uh, the most wise, righteous, and gracious God oft, doth oft times leave for a season his own children, okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, ver then six, as for those wicked and ungodly men whom God as a righteous judge for former sins doth blind and harden, from them he not only withholdeth his grace whereby they might have been enlightened in their understanding and wrought upon in their hearts, but sometimes also withdraw the gifts which they had and exposeth them to such objects as their corruption makes occasions of sin and withal gives them over to their own lusts. Uh, the temptations of the world and the power of Satan, whereby it comes to pass that they harden themselves, and here's the crucial thing, under 
even under those means which God useth for the softening of others. That's the profound insight. So the same thing, you know, you, the, the car accident, I, I get run over, I'm, I'm, I'm paralyzed. One person is going to lie in bed and shake his fist at God and blaspheme him because of the accident. The other one is going to bow his head in humble, in humble submission. Same event, entirely different responses. God's purposes are different with uh, respect to the godly and with respect to the, un the ungodly. In, 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 in the very same events, those uh, differing purposes are worked out. Uh, that's 12, 13, many people struggle with the doctrines of God's absolute sovereignty. Do they make God the author of evil? Do they remove the incentive for prayer? Um, and then 14, others claim that it's only God's sovereignty that makes life meaningful. Do you agree? Uh, well, the in incentive for evangelism and it's an incentive, uh, incentive for prayer. Um, and then uh, 14 makes life meaningful. So I, I would, I've, well, I, my argument is that historically that that is not the case. That the greatest evangelists in the history of the church have been Calvinists. They've been predestinarians. You can go right through, I've written it up in the notes. But you, you, can, you can go right through certainly modern church history, you know. Uh, the Puritans were great evangelists. They're basically all Calvinists. George Whitfield is a great evangelist of the, um, of the Great Awakening. Uh, the leaders of the Second what Great Awakening, they were all Calvinists. Spurgeon, a, a Calvinist. In modern times, uh, evangelism explosion, D. James Kennedy, the creator of that, an evangelist, uh, a, a Calvinist. Uh, Bill Bright, the creator of uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, he was a Calvinist. Um, the modern missionary movement, William Carey, right through the next hundred years, ba basically driven by Calvinists because they believe God is able to save. That it's worthwhile taking the gospel because the gospel is the power of God and it's through the gospel, through those means that God saves. So likewise, prayer, I think, properly is seen as a means. It is a means to the end. And in the same way that I don't expect my socks to jump out of the drawers and get on my feet because God has ordained that I should wear a certain pair of socks on a certain day, but there's a means to get the socks on the feet, and that is going over to the drawer, opening it, to take out the sock. The same way prayer is a means. The effectual prayer of the righteous man accomplishes much, James chapter 5. It accomplishes. God responds to the prayers of his people. Jesus said, ask. He uses active participles. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Uh, keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking and you shall find and it shall be given to you. So it is a means to, to the, the righteous ends that we, are, that we are seeking. So no, it does not remove the incentive uh, for evangelism. It emboldens me to go to the gospel into dark places because it is the power of God. And no, it, it doesn't uh, disincentivize prayer because prayer is a means whereby the purposes of God are fulfilled. All right, we've slightly gone over time. Um, hope you all can come back tomorrow. Um, yes? Uh, for tomorrow, are we going to do study six and seven, which is chapters? We will do six. Okay. So we'll get as far as we can, okay. and then we'll finish the following week. So it's a two-week. Chapter six and seven, or just chapter six? Six, seven, eight. We just you just go as far as you can in six.